from San Francisco, California. This is the Rock and Roll Geek Show. This is the story of my rock and roll butler. <clears throat> Welcome to the Rock and Roll Geek Show. My name's Michael Butler. Thanks a lot for joining me. I really appreciate it. Today's Tuesday, August 7th, 2018, and it's 5.12 p.m. when I'm recording this episode. This is day seven of the Dog Days of Podcasting, where I'm attempting to do a show a day for the entire month of August. I'm driving in my car now. I'm heading to Featherwitch practice. We are auditioning drummers tonight. If you want to find out the story about why we or how we lost our longtime drummer Doug, uh, tune into a previous episode of Mad at Dad. I don't remember which one. Probably like two episodes ago. But we're auditioning drummers tonight. <clears throat> Not too crazy about the drummer. I'm I'm not a big fan of auditioning people. I like to keep bands intact, but sometimes things happen that are beyond your control and it's time to make a change. Well, it was a time to make a change. Last night I went to the Ace Freely show um, in Berkeley at the Cornerstone, which was where we're playing this Thursday. I have Featherwitch practice tonight. It's it's a crazy week tonight, or this week. I have Featherwitch practice tonight, Butler's practice tomorrow. We are opening for LA Guns on Thursday in Berkeley. Friday I have off. But I'm going to load my kayak up and all my fishing stuff. I'm leaving at about 2 in the morning to drive to Monterey for a fishing tournament. And then I have to be in Santa Rosa that afternoon for a gig Saturday night with the Butlers. We're opening again for LA Guns at a place called House of Rock in Santa Rosa. So it's a busy week for me. And I didn't stay for the entire show last night because I have to get up at 5 in the morning and I'm working every day this week and I just, it's just brutal on me. At my age, if I'm up past 10 o'clock, I'm, I'm dead the next day. Well, here I am on um, five hours sleep heading to practice. So, um, yeah, so I had left the, AC, the Ace Freely show a little bit early last night. I left during the cheesy bass solo. One thing I'll say about the show, Ace Freely, he was great, but come on, man. Take off the sunglasses. Played the entire set with sunglasses on inside. Pardon me, I'm burping up this fine Red Bull and trying to wake up. So, today, as promised yesterday, I'm going to do part two of my Exodus adventures. Uh, Paul Houston sent, sent an email, a show suggestion for the dog days, asking me to tell my all the whole deal about uh, my Exodus stories, or about my time in Exodus. When we left off yesterday, I got the gig in Exodus, obviously, we already knew that, <clears throat> and Gary gave me a cassette of demos of the album that we're going to be recording in England with Chris Sangaridis producing. So I rehearsed and rehearsed, or listened and listened and listened, and then showed up to rehearsal, and I had the songs pretty well down. So we you know, we did the standard rehearsal. We practiced uh, like three days a week for like two weeks before we headed over to England. Um, I think they may have headed out there before me. I think so. This company called Rocket Cargo took all of our gear, so we leave all our gear. I packed in packed two bases. Uh, I don't know if I, I don't think I brought any amplifiers or anything. I think we rented stuff when we were there. Uh, but I did have bases shipped over. And um, I just missed my turn. Son of a bitch. Had bases shipped over. I shipped over, uh, I think I shipped the Telecaster base and, and a um, white... 1976 Gibson Thunderbird, which is like super rare. You very rarely see any um, anniversary white Gibson Thunderbirds. Those things are like most of the most of the 76 anniversary Thunderbirds were um, were tobacco sunbursts. So a white one, very rare to find. Well, it was one of my prized bases, and I brought I shipped that and the Telly. So got over there. Uh, I, th- I think I did go with uh, Gary 
We had an apartment rented there on Finchley Road. Remember flying with Gary and taking a taxi to the, uh, we took a taxi, it seemed like a long, long taxi ride. It took forever to get where we were going. We went to some, first we, the first night we stayed in an apartment and then we were gonna move over to a, uh, apartment on another side of town which, which actually was a house on another side of town <clears throat> where we would be staying for the duration of the recording of the album of Exodus's album and turns out uh, I, yesterday I said when I walked into the audition that they said look he's got the chin well the reason they said that is uh, this was the second Capitol Records album that Exodus uh, so they the one that they did before this on Capitol was called Impact is Imminent and this was their major label debut they were on Combat Records before and I think they wanted to make a statement that uh, they weren't selling out so rather than go a little bit more commercial when you're on a major label which would seem like a lot of bands would you know try to progress to a, a higher level um, the guys in Exodus wanted to prove this is what I get out of it. They wanted to prove to the fans that uh, they were no sellouts. So they made an album that was like more thrash than any album they've ever done. Way faster and way more thrash. And it was a complete uh, anti-commercial album. And consequently, it didn't do that well for Capital. This didn't do what Capital was expecting them to do. So... Uh, apparently the powers that be at Capitol said well, we're gonna give you one more album we're gonna to, to uh, you know to to redeem yourself we really like you to do to for this one to be a commercial success and around that time um, Metallica had the black album and it, as you know it was a huge massive success for uh, Metallica it was around that same time and I think the guys in Exodus kind of wanted to model it sort of after that album with, by me meaning uh, I think more groove song groove oriented songs and when I walked in and they said he's got the chin what they meant was I looked a lot like Jason Newstead and they saw that as a good sign about why why I might be the guy because I look like Jason Newstead and it was kind of a, an omen that they were leaning towards like Metallica. This is what I gathered out of it. So anyway, so the pressure was kind of on for Exodus to um, make a commercial album. And to, if you go back and uh, ask the guys in Exodus what their least favorite album was, I think they would all say it's the album that I was on, Force of Habit. I think it got kind of a bum rap because... Uh, they were trying to appease the record label, but I think the songs are quality songs. They were a little bit slower and a lot more uh, long, long, complicated songs. But uh, I thought it was a good album. And I think if you go back and listen to it now, a lot of the fans look back on that album with fondness. But anyway, so we get to to London. I had never been to London before. We stayed in it. We had a place on Finchley Road. And I remember every day after recording, we would go uh, to this pub and just hang out at the pub every night. Uh, the album took about a month to record. The whole time I was there, I grilled Chris Sangaridis for Thin Lizzy stories. And he had a lot of them. He had a lot of great Thin Lizzy stories. By the way, make Chris Sangaridis rest in peace. Very nice man. He was a spitting image of um, Gene Wilder, I thought. And, and a, cross be a cross between Gene Wilder and Mick Box, the guy from um, Uriah Heep. Anyway, so I grill, I was grilling him for, for Thin Lizzy stories all the time. And Ian Gillen stores stories. Ian Gillen did Toolbox there, and Bruce Dickinson. Uh, I think he might have did one of the Bruce Dickinson albums, Tattooed Millionaire, I think. So we we recorded the album at Battery Studios, very famous studios, Battery Battery Studios, really nice studios too. And I remember I had a I had my own room for the bass, 
and I had my base rig set up in there and to make the mood more to me I put this is really stupid now looking back on it but I put uh, penthouse photos and stuff all over the wall which I don't know why I did that I was kind of dumb but that's what I did and did the basic tracks in that room everything went pretty smoothly I thought I had a great time recording it man I had a fucking great time it was just so much such a great experience hanging out in England for you know for a month my wife came for the last two weeks and after we finished recording uh, Capital set up a get a a post album recording show at a place called the Marquee Club which is a very world famous club I mean the Who played there and you know the Stones I believe played there. everybody famous played the Marquee Club in London so I remember that show of my very first gig with Exodus and I remember j sitting backstage joking that I was really nervous which I wasn't nervous I was more excited and it was sold out it was a blast show I had a good time I jumped around like a maniac and you know rocked out everybody was in high spirits and after the gig uh, we all went back to the pub where we hang out hung out every night and Andy a friend of mine Andy Anderson who was in a band called Two Bit Thief came out to the show and I pretty much hung out with him at that pub the entire night um, watching Angel City videos or the Angels videos he I think he might have brought these tapes I'm, maybe they were I don't know who brought the videos but I just remember sitting in that bar watching Angels videos all night long and I had never seen any of these videos so I was geeking out on the Angels after this uh, Exodus show fun times were had in England uh, the album was set to be released, I don't know, several months later. I think it came out like in the winter. And like I said, um, Metallica's album was just doing gangbusters at the time. And I remember when we were recording, uh, an album just came out and was taking the world by storm. And that was an album called Nevermind from, from Nirvana that changed the face of music in not in a good way for everybody including metal bands also at the same time our album or about two or three months before Exodus album was coming out Megadeth released their biggest selling album of their career called Countdown to Extinction so the <laughs> with Megadeth coming out with their album which was by the way on the same label as Exodus album so you know Capitol Records are they gonna put everything behind two metal bands when Nirvana is taking over the charts or are they can only put their money behind one metal band well you do the math of who, who sold war sold more uh, we did I remember we did go to the um, Megadeth record release party and at a Museum of Natural History or something like that in, in LA <clears throat> that was fun I had lots of great experiences there at this time you know I would hear them talk about how much pressure was on for them to make a good album and for it to be a big seller and I was just looking at this from I'm happy to be on a major label and not playing in a punk rock band you know struggling I'm, I'm to me I've hit the big time <laughs> I did, it didn't even strike me whether um, the album had to be a big seller or not. I did, as far as I was concerned, I had made it. I was a success. I was in a touring, I was in a touring, traveling band, making a living, playing rock and roll, be it heavy metal or whatever. I was making a living on a major label in England, having the time of my life. I remember my wife came out, hung out with me for two weeks in England for the last two weeks had a blast I was on my way man <laughs> album was coming out on Capitol Records I didn't it didn't even occur to me how much how much pressure was on the band <sighs> so okay should, should I do stop it there and 
Ah, oh, fuck it. Why don't I just keep going? So the album comes out. I don't remember what, when it was released. But the album came out, and um, we were heading... We were to go on tour to support the album with Black Sabbath. They just had the Dehumanizer album came out. Let me take another sip of this fine Red Bull. So the Black Sabbath Dehumanizer album was... was the first album with Ronnie James Dio back in the band. So that was a good tour for us. Because, uh, you know, everybody was excited to see Dio back in Black Sabbath. I think before that they had the Eternal Cross or something like that. With, who, who was in that? Tony Martin or something like that? I don't even... I don't, I got me. I'm not an authority on Black Sabbath. I think it's somebody like that. That Eternal Cross album. Or is that Eternal Idol? Whatever that album was, it didn't do that well. But Dehumanizer did, and all those shows that we played with Sabbath on the on that tour, they were pretty much all sold out. And I heard, I'm living the dream, man, on tour with Black Sabbath, Geezer Butler on bass. I'm fall, I'm sitting on the side of the stage every night watching Geezer Butler just tear the bass up. And the entire tour, I was afraid to go up and talk to him. Finally, the last day of the tour, I got the nerve up to go ask Geezer if I could get my picture taken with him. And I, and I had me and Geezer, he came up, he actually came up to me and talked to me the last day of the tour, finally. And I still have the, that picture. And I had Christmas cards made up with me and Geezer Butler. And it said, Merry Christmas from the Butlers. <laughs> Good times, man. There was another band on that tour called Skew Siskin. It was Skew Siskin, Exodus, and Black Sabbath. Skew Siskin had a buy-in. They were, it was a buy-in. What A buy-in, for people who don't know, is uh, the band has to pay to be on the tour. And they, they paid, I don't know, probably like 50 grand or something like that. The record Sometimes record labels will do a buy-in to try to get you know their up-and-coming band some exposure. Had a great time. We had tour support that entire tour, which meant... The record label was paying us that tour, and uh, <clears throat> we stayed in five-star hotels every night, traveled in a tour bus, and I was having the time of my life. After that tour, I think we took like a month off, and then uh, the next tour we had was Body Count, DRI, Exodus, and Propane. DRI and Exodus flip flop for the support slots. Um, body Count, Ice T and Body Count. That Cop Killer album, I don't know what album the album was called, but they had the song Cop Killer, which was all over the news. So consequently, every show on that tour was sold out, like way sold out because. There was so much controversy surrounding Body Count. The news was at every show. Police were protesting every show because of the Cop Killer song. Again, I'm on top of the world, man. I'm playing sold out shows. <laughs> the news at every show. Having the time of my life. <laughs> I can't tell you how much fun I was having, man. It was This was a dream come true for me. There were rumblings on that tour that um, Exodus may be getting dropped because tour support stopped. Uh, we, we stopped really hearing from the record label very much. Uh, everybody's paycheck stopped coming. <laughs> we had to like bug Tony, the manager, hey, where's our money? Where's our money? And she's scrambling, trying to get advances from the merchandise company to pay everybody. And uh, at this time, John Tempesta, I could hear him rum rumblings from him about he was going to thinking about quitting the band. And the band's falling apart at the seams. But me, I'm having the time of my life. I'm touring in Exodus. I'm not playing. I'm not eating pork and beans every night. I'm eating good food. I'm touring and having a fucking blast. So we, so the last day of that tour, was it the last day of that tour? I think, 
No, it was not the last day of that tour. The last day of the Body Count Tour, we, we played the Palace. Not the, the last day of the Sabbath Tour, we played the Palace. We veered off. Um, Sabbath went on to do another show. We played the Palace at Ricky Rockman's birthday party. It was us, White Zombie, Pantera, a bunch of other bands like that. That was a great show as well. And after that, we were pretty, I think we got, I think we had a couple more months before we finally got dropped from, um, from Capitol. So the record ended up selling like 75,000 or something like that, which was, which was another huge disappointment, but I got to go to Japan with Exodus, even after we were dropped, and we traveled first class in Japan, took a bullet train to uh, one of the places we played on the other side of Japan. We played theaters in Japan, uh, had a great time. I remember one story in Japan, we, the promoters, had they would take us out to dinner every night, and the guys in Exodus wanted to go to Denny's, if you can believe that. <laughs> well, one night they took us to a really nice shabu shabu place, where it's a place where they uh, cook, they bring all this raw meat to the table, and they put, cook it in broth. Some of the guys in the band were so pissed off that night, they were, they were just rattling off like derogatory stuff about Japanese people and how they wanted to go to Denny's and I felt so bad for the guy for the promoter guys they were really nice Japanese men and this restaurant was fantastic I was loving it so the next night they had to take us to Denny's in Japan you can imagine going to Denny's in Japan another thing that happened when I was in Exodus uh, when I came back from recording I'm going through the tunnel here. I came back from recording from you know from recording the album and I went to pick up to check on my gear and maybe pick up my bases and one of my bases never came back. Or at least it wasn't in the band room. And I was calling Rocket Cargo accusing them of losing my base and everything else and they were they didn't what turned out was uh, somebody in the group ended up stealing uh, that base. This is at least what I think. I'm not going to name names, but uh, the story that I gathered were, were the, the thing that I gathered was somebody in the band stole the base and bought drugs with, with it. So. 